Um, my name is Anne Light and I'm Professor of Design at the University of Sussex and I want to welcome you to the first in a short series of discussions between creative practitioners and policy makers in the area of transformation and the making of more sustainable futures. This one is run by the Creatures Project in conjunction with the new European Bauhaus, an EU initiative to bring beauty, inclusivity and sustainability into the heart of everything designed to make a difference. This evening, our focus is upon the world around us and how human beings relate to it, particularly how policy is framed in relation to it. I hesitate to use the word nature, but it's in the title of our panel. So I will just add the caveat that the project from which this series of discussions is drawn, the Creatures Project or Creative Practices for Transformative Futures, of which you'll hear more soon, seeks to open up nature as a category to avoid anything that separates people from the rest of what is around us or suggests a gulf between what people do and its impacts on us as part of the living planet. However, in mainstream politics and policy work, nature is a commonly discussed phenomenon and one with some classic framings. We see approaches that understand nature as a resource to use, an outdoors space to be protected, an ecosystem service, more recently, a solution to the climate crisis. For instance, trees have acquired significant financial value, not only because they take a long time to grow, but because they're a necessary part of dealing with an increasingly unstable climate. The benefits they offer, including trapping and slowing rainwater, energy conservation, carbon sequestration, heat island reduction, and improvements to air and water quality. But that's a very narrow account of a tree's function which ignores, for example, how trees support biodiversity or mental health. And if we move away from a functional account altogether, ignores the sheer wonder of a tree as a life form and one so different from us, a being that does not scurry from one thing to the next, a being that regularly outlives us and challenges our sense of time and urgency. So what else might we say about the living forms around us? Tonight, we create space for creative practice on what these framing be just futures. And we have positioned the discussion in the context of ferality, the wildness that coexists with us, the part tamed and the unruly. We ask what it means to encounter the world as feral multi-species ecologies, poor as matters of ecological politics and more than human worlds. What that does to our sense of nature, what is within and what is outside. Thus, when we consider nature, whether it's managed or out of control, we may be asking a series of other questions, such as how are creative practitioners interacting with policy and decision makers around nature? How might creative practitioners and policy makers help each other to rethink relationships between humans and other species and ecosystems? How can our existing work around the term feral help us to engage policy, particularly around issues of control? So we welcome six speakers from diverse backgrounds. Each will talk for a few minutes and then there will be time for broader discussion. So please post your thoughts and comments and questions in the chat at any time. and We will pick them up as we finish hearing from our last panelist. And now I'm gonna hand over to my colleague, Lara, to chair the session. Oh, welcome everyone. I am absolutely delighted to introduce Astrid Magnus, who is a researcher at the Netherlands Institute for Social Research. And that's in the Department of Government Perspectives, Citizen Perspectives and Behaviour. She holds a PhD from Utrecht University, where she studied the role that creative and experimental futures practice can play in realizing urban trans sustainability transformations. So over to you, Astrid. Thank you, Alara. Um, let me first share my screen because I have some slides prepared. Let's see if this works. Oh. Okay, there they are. All right. Um, Astrid. Yeah, so yeah. Sorry, Astrid, we're just seeing your Word documents oh. at the moment rather than your slides. Oh, I'm sorry, let me try that again. Uh, okay, I think it should work like this. Is this better? Wonderful. Okay, perfect. 
Well, thank you for the wonderful introduction, uh, Lara. And it's really great to be here this afternoon, especially in such great company. Um, and as Lara already said, I work for the um, Netherlands Institute for Social Research, uh, which is part of the Ministry of uh, Health, Welfare and Sports. Um, and before that, at the beginning of this year, I was still a researcher in the Creatures Project. So I've seen, um, well, I've, I was in academia before and I've moved to policy research, uh, which I think are two interesting perspectives. And as the first speaker of today, I was asked to provide um, a brief introduction to the concept of transformations. Um, and after that, I wanted to reflect briefly on how in the Creatures Project, we have made attempts to bridge um, the worlds of policy and uh, creative practice. And after that, I wanted to reflect on that from my experiences so far in the policy world. And I end with some questions um, that we can hopefully get into later in the panel. Um, so first of all, the definition of transformations that I often use is by uh, my former colleague, James Patterson and his uh, co-authors. And it states that transformations are fundamental changes in structural, functional, relational and cognitive aspects of socio-technical ecological systems that lead to new patterns of interactions and outcomes. And of course, these new patterns of interactions and new outcomes are very urgent and highly necessary um, in this current moment where we're facing climate change, uh, mass extinction, um, uh, stepping over the planetary boundaries. Um, but of course, conceptualizing and initiating um, transformational change is not as easy. Well, it doesn't appear easy at all, actually. It's, it's very difficult. Um, so in previous research, um, I did a literature review on how we can use creative practice um, as a kind of futures method um, in order to think about and start sustainability transformations. And from this literature review, which was about the uh, literature on governance, the literature on transformations and the acad academic literature on futures, um, it emerged that there are actually four challenges to um, using creative practices in and futures in this way. First of all, it asks that we uh, include different perspectives and assumptions uh, about the future. So I think uh, traditionally in policy and, and um, in other places as well, people tend to um, look at the future in a kind of predictive way, um, li uh, limiting uncertainty. Um, and sort of shy away from the speculative and the open-ended um, engagement with the future. Um, but if we want to move towards sustainability transformations, it's very uh, important to include those different ways of engaging with the future. Also, there is a need for novel approaches and methodologies. And I think in this um, company that we're with this afternoon, um, this is of course, well, there are a lot of people who are breaking new grounds here with different creative practices, so that's really great. Um, then another challenge is to make space for participation. And I think tonight maybe it's interesting to also talk about participation of nature and participation of different species, which is, I think, the new frontier uh, in a way in this, in this challenge. And then finally, if we use creative practices um, to open up new futures and to um, aim for transformations, we also need to redefine what is success and how do we measure success. And this is, I think, also really important to policymakers. Um, and what I noticed so far um, in my work in policy research is that it is, of course, very anthropocentric. And I think that is sort of a logical result of the fact that we have this wonderful democratic process where policymakers um, answer to uh, ministers and to the parliament. Um, and they are, um, well, they answer to um, the people who have elected them. Um, so this results in humans representing humans and people like me are researching the perspectives of fellow humans, but at the same time, um, well-being, sustainability, health are all of these very um, current important topics that actually have a lot of space in them to include nature and to engage with nature and different species in new and more interesting ways. And in the Creatures Project, um, and this is still ongoing, there have been really wonderful um, uh, pieces of work where we try to bring together policymakers and creative practitioners and researchers 
in what we called, or well, we, we took this concept from the Urban Future Studio from Marathon Heyer, um, in soft spaces, or you can also call them in-between spaces. So these settings that are outside the uh, traditional policy space, that are also outside of traditional policy rules and interests and uh, power dynamics, perhaps, for as far as that is possible, um, where people can engage in different ways with, with different species. For example, the picture on the top right is an installation by Superflux, um, which is a multi-species dining experience. Um, but uh, I also included the Zoop example here because we're going to hear from that, about that a little bit more in a moment from a class, but I think that is also a really exciting uh, example. So I took the liberty of including it here of where, where policy or governance structures and different species meet in this, these new um, and exciting spaces where I think new possibilities can be opened up. Um, and then the other two examples, well, the one on the bottom is a, a multi-generational policy um, process in Japan uh, with people that we've worked with there. Um, and I think intergenerational um, questions of governance are also very interesting if we talk about multi-species, but also future people, I think, um, should be included here. One minute um, left, Astrid. Yes, thank you. Well, then my final slide, um, and I think in, in terms of um, bridging this gap between policy and creative practice and nature, especially feral nature, on the short term, I thought um, a very pressing issue, I think, is how can we get people into these soft spaces, into these in-between dynamics and really show this value for people taking the time to do something speculative um, and open-ended that is outside the normal normal policy interaction, I think. And then long term, um, what I would be really interested in discussing is how can we creatively explore options for real institutional change and perhaps democratic reforms so we can include nature, we can include a variety um, of species, and we can include future generations. So hoping to talk a bit, little bit more about that later. Thank you very much. Oh, wow, Astrid, thank you so much for giving us a mini state of the art on the transformations for sustainability field, the idea of transformations, and also kind of um, bridges from creative practice into policy. That's fabulous. Our next speaker is Clive Mitchell, and he's a strategic resource manager allocating resources for nature and climate change at Nature Scott. He's also an advisor to WWF in Scotland and a member of the steering group for the Sustainable Scotland Network. And he's also an honorary fellow of the Royal Scottish Geographical Society. So Clive, I invite you to take the virtual floor and uh, share your slides and, and um, I'll pop up with one minute to go and, and let you know. Thanks a lot, Lara, and lovely to see you all. Um, whether we think nature is managed or out of control depends an awful lot on the boundaries that we put around it. So let's start with some boundaries, um, some definitions, or at least some narratives about definitions. Uh, this is the easy bit. Um, I only have one slide, as I said, but I'll, it's quite bitty, um, or quite, um, it's quite a, a busy one, so I'll build it up slowly. So, well, what is nature? Um, first of all, it's actually difficult to define. Um, there are all the bits of it that are alive, um, genetic species, habitats, ecosystems, and that's biodiversity. But then there's all the features of the environment, forces and processes that allow interactions and evolution and so on. And that's what I would understand by nature. I'm going to focus on science-led definitions because they're what mainly drive policy and practice from the UN's conventional and biological diversity onward. And within this, conservation has tended to adopt an even narrower focus with, with biodiversity, uh, particularly on the nature that might form protected areas and certain priority habitats and species, rather than say, all life everywhere. So having defined it, we might want to measure it. <clears throat> and 
that's quite difficult as well, actually. And there are some examples I've just put up on the slide there. Usually what prevails is the stuff that's easier to measure, like species. We can count them. We can say something about their diversity, their abundance. Uh, but even a species is a bit of a slippery entity. Back to definitions, they're reproductively isolated groups. Uh, that's pretty useful for describing how things are now. But that definition can't be true all of the time. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here meeting tonight having this conversation. Over time, genes transfer between species and they evolve into new ones. Now we've got some measures, we can tell some stories. But underlying the stories we tell are the other stories that we're not so open about. These are our worldviews, how we come to view and understand the world and our place in it. This is where things start to get really tricky. Are we a part of nature or apart from it? Does nature have intrinsic value or are we mainly concerned with how useful it is and how do we measure that? Are we concerned with people and nature or a multi-species view? Georgina Mace described four approaches to nature from the 1950s in the UK. First, nature for itself, with nature mainly in reserves. That was followed by a narrative around pressures on nature, nature despite people. Then around the turn of the century, the emphasis shifted to the benefits um, to people, people and ecosystem services. And finally, she speculated on a further phase around nature and people, some form of coexistence that recognizes everything I've just said can coexist together at the same time. Maybe we don't need to make these choices. And on that note, if I was to pick out just one of those, I would, it would be relational values. This is the idea that what matters to me is how much I care about what you think I do for the environment. If I care about what you think, you're one of us. And if I don't, you're one of them. We tend to surround ourselves with people and views like our own because it's comfortable. And this, is, is, this, of course, is echoed and magnified by the algorithms that drive social media and the echo chambers that we're all familiar with. We need to work really hard to break down those chambers and barriers to communication and creative practices can have a hugely important role in that. Of course, these narratives also drive the definitions that we prefer for nature and our favored measures, and hence the stories we tell, round and round we go. And we need to be conscious of these biases and how we're treading through the landscape that I'm painting here. Next, of course, these narratives also drive policy and nature is fraught with policy challenges. There's the uneven distribution of costs and benefits that arise from choices and how we use natural resources. And whether I care about who wins and who loses will depend on my underlying narratives and who is us and who is them. Similarly for other asymmetries, whether to do with space, like actions on the hill to reduce flood risk for people elsewhere, downstream or on the coast, or time, actions now for benefits to future generations, or affluence, the rich and the poor. And biodiversity gives rise to overlapping public goods from local to global. Globally, nature through soils regulates the global carbon cycle and hence climate. Shouldn't that be an important part of our definition and measurement? These features are a nightmare for policy and these asymmetries sit at the heart of environmental and climate justice. Finally, we can bring all sorts of perspectives to bear on this. Everyone has a view and, again to quote Georgina Mace, the view from nowhere does not exist. There's no objectivity as such in this. These views matters, but which ones we pay attention to will be driven by our definitions, measures and narratives and who or what we care about. In terms of environmental justice, these are the issues to do with recognition and procedure. Who gets a say and a seat at the table? So in short, nature is socially constructed. We find meaning in its context and context vary. It's deeply political, but most policy and practice shies away from this, preferring instead the relative safety of scientific framings. And of course, we cannot separate climate from nature. It's a system that's co-evolved for the last four billion years, and it isn't gonna stop doing that anytime soon. And yet, because of our definitions and measures and narratives, much policy and practice is founded on the premise that they are separate, giving rise to false choices between them. I could go on all night, but I won't. And while this complex landscape for policymakers is hard to navigate for policymakers, 
this very complexity is a gift for creativity, art and design. And maybe it's time to bring that more to the fore. And I'll stop there and pass back to Lara to start busting some of these barriers. Thank you. Wow, Clive, that is a tremendous presentation from Astrid's introduction. You've really cracked open some of the huge challenges in this space, kind of um, science led ways of knowing ecosystems and how they clash with human worldviews and really the challenges of making policy across both of those and, and for the benefits um, of all huge questions about justice and equality that are also kind of part of the transformations framing. So thank you so very much for that. Okay, wonderful. So next up we have got um, Marketa Dolesheva. Um, and Marketa is a member of the Creatures Project. I'm delighted to have her as a colleague. She is a design researcher. Oops, sorry. She is a design researcher experimenting with embodied relational ways of knowing and doing, often in multi-species settings. Um, she works on creatures as a postdoctoral research fellow at Aalto University in Finland, and she co-leads creative and research activities at the Ouroboros Festival and the Feeding Food Futures Collective. So over to you, Marketa. Thanks, Laura. Thank you for the really nice intro. So yeah, I'm going to talk today about the Creatures Laboratory, which is uh, one of the core parts of the Creatures Project that enables us to experience and experiment with diverse transformational creative practices. And I will focus today uh, specifically on the kind of creative practice that addresses the feral and more than human concerns. So in the laboratory, we co-develop uh, creative projects or experimental productions, as we call them, that are pursuing this goal to support positive eco-social change. And our main aim with the laboratory is to see how do creative practitioners implement their work on the ground, how they materialize and communicate their eco-social ideas and provocations, and how do they engage uh, various audiences uh, with their work. Uh, so the laboratory contributors come from very diverse fields of creative practice, I would say, including, for instance, studio design work, academic design research, fine arts, community activism, or cultural mediation. So it's quite a rich place where various disciplines and knowledges come together and where the contributors ideally listen to each other, learn and help each other to further develop uh, their own works. And in total, uh, the laboratory collection involves 20 XPs, uh, experimental productions that were curated together in quite an open-ended manner. Uh, so some of them were invited at the outset of the project. Some have been commissioned later to respond to the unfolding research processes and also to the themes that started emerging in creatures uh, over the time. And this open-ended and sort of relational approach to arts curating, I would say quite nicely reflects uh, the processual nature of many creative practices, where we usually accept that meanings reveal themselves on the way and our initial standpoints are likely to change rather than being strictly fixed. So following this approach in creatures really enables us to be reflective and flexible in responding to timely social and ecological issues like, for instance, COVID, which kind of emerged during the project and really brought in a very new layer of eco-social concerns uh, for us. So with this in mind, uh, with this open-ended curatorial approach uh, in mind, the laboratory really gathers XP this focus, that focus on a very varied scope of themes, of course, within the overarching area of eco-social change. Uh, and here you can see an overview of uh, themes and approaches that we have identified across the XP so far. So you can see that they cover themes ranging from, for instance, interspecies pluralism to social equality to sustainable businesses. And they leverage uh, participatory approaches ranging from storytelling or myth making to, for instance, gaming and, and prefigurative enactments. But now today uh, I will focus on those experts that are addressing the themes in uh, ecological interconnectedness and more than human relationalities. Uh, and I will also show you very briefly four perspectives that the experts are taking to address these themes. So to start with, uh, the first perspective or approach maybe can be defined as uh, creating spaces for contemplation about more human and human lives to provoke imaginaries of better relational futures. And a good example of XP here is the Refuge for Resurgence project that uh, Astrid already mentioned 
which is an installation designed by the Superflex Studio that uh, presents a multi-species dinner, inviting various species to sit together around a shared table to symbolize their ecological interdependence. So it is a very human-driven imagination of a future where all species are equal. And the aim here is to create a space for thinking and reflection where viewers can ponder upon the possible relational futures, but also the existing anthropocentric frictions. The second approach uh, is uh, experimenting with and around non-humans to observe and learn from them and create a new sustainable practices. Uh, example here would be uh, the microbiome uh, project, which is a series of workshops curated together by a Kersnikova organization, where participants learn about the life cycle of fungi, experiment uh, with various both practical and speculative uses of fungi as a climate-friendly biomaterial, and discuss how we can coexist with mushrooms in a sort of reciprocally supportive way. Then the third approach is pretending to be non-humans to embody existing human non-human boundaries and speculate on possible futures. Really good example here is the Treaty of Queensbury Park uh, project, which is developed by the Further Field Organization, uh, which is a LARP, live action role play, where participants assume the roles of various species uh, together uh, and together participate in uh, multi-species assemblies, where they negotiate how to reclaim better living conditions for themselves, but also for other non-human creatures on the planet. And then finally, the last fourth approach is cohabiting with and learning from non-humans in a long term in a sort of everyday life on the ground manner. An example here would be the Open Forest Project, which uh, for XP, which consists of a series of experimental walks through and with various forest patches that are guided by various human or non-human navigators. And one of these patches, for example, is located in central Bohemia, where the walks are guided by Chewy who is a dog uh, and who has a very good knowledge of the local landscape, of course. So we follow Chewy without any map on a regular day-to-day -day basis. We let him decide where he wants to walk. And we simply walk with and wait what will come our way. And of course, the point here is to see what we can learn as humans if we give up on our full control over our movement through time and space and try to attune to a rhythm and interest, sensorial interest, especially of a non-human creature. And here in the project, we also draw on so-called feral methodologies, where feral refers to something that emerges within human infrastructures, but unfolds beyond human control. So in our case, we use the word feral to signify that the walks unfold beyond our full control as designers and researchers. And then the last project I will show is the Open Urban Forest uh, XP, uh, which is located in a wild green uh, wild garden in the urban area of the city of Brno in Moravia where the author Michal Mitro lives uh, with the garden. He observes and experiments with various approaches to the management of the local ecosystem, learning from the non-human garden creatures. But he's also witnessing uh, some kind of like nefarious human-driven landscaping development that happens uh, on the other side of the valley, which heavily affects the garden ecosystem. But uh, I will stop talking now and basically leave the floor to Michal because I'm sure he will give us more details about the project. Uh, so to summarize or conclude, uh, maybe I would suggest that the XPs provide a good occasion for various publics to experience the more than human themes and issues in practice, but also an occasion for the Creatures Project to collect data, conduct ethnographic research, and analyze the XPs for their impact to better understand what transformational creative practice can do in real life uh, and how and for what end. And yeah, that's it for me. Thanks for listening. Thank you so much, Marquette. So you've given us such a really interesting overview of some types of um, approaches that creative practitioners are taking at the moment, um, as well as a stellar overview of creatures. And without further ado, because you already led us into Mikhail's work, I want to introduce Mikhail Mitro, who is an artist and a researcher working across different fields of disciplines and media. He's been trained in psychology and sociology, and he really focuses on the nuances of everyday life, as well as hyper objects of planetary scale, of course, climate change that brings us here uh, today in part. And in his artistic practice, he translates his sociological imagination into crafted sculptural environments with elements of sight, sound, light, or electricity. 
So over to you, Michal, and I'll, I'm going to pop up after six minutes and let you know there's one minute to go. Thank you. Um, so thank you very much, Laura, and thanks, Marketa, as well. <laughs> I still have a little bit left to say as well. Um, so yeah, and thanks, Creature, of course, for supporting me in my endeavor and, and my fellow uh, research guests. Uh, I guess I'll skip the introduction because I've been introduced very well. And uh, uh, what you're seeing uh, on the screen is is actually the the research site itself, and uh, we'll virtually climb from from the street level all the way up. Um, so I hope you don't get nauseous. <laughs> And so the Open Urban Forest is a six month uh, research project and it's exploring how the human and the more than human work with and around each other, as, as Marketa said. And I actually thought this uh, step or the access route is, is, is a nice representation of how the two intermingle in, in this particular context. And these explorations are situated uh, in a nature reclaimed uh, communal garden located on the hills of Svratka River in, in Brno in Czech Republic in Moravia. And even if this place is not uh, being directly shaped by humans anymore, since it's not really used as a garden, uh, it is still shaped by a multitude of human initiated contexts such as traffic infrastructure extension, uh, drought, and municipal urban planning, which are all interlinked, uh, but at the very same time, it is becoming increasingly feral uh, and harder to access for, for humans, at least. And so um, throughout the project duration, uh, the guest experts from field of architecture, forestry, visual arts, uh, field recording or sound recording and performance art have uh, visited the forest on various occasions and they all conducted uh, their specific research. They've invited to observe, analyze, abstract, or speculate on meanings and data sets that the forest uh, conveys to them or to which they just happen to incline. And all of us equipped with our unique tools, knowledges and viewpoints, uh, we're hoping to jointly shape an intersubjective representation of the forest uh, that would uh, reflect its stacked and multifocal nature as opposed to just me sharing the knowledge I already have of it. And by doing so, uh, we were hoping to set an inviting and supportive base for the interspecies dialogue and rainforest dynamics that make the space open, urban and forest. And as for my person, personal involvement with, with the garden, which now is turning into forest, um, that's eight years back. Uh, and in this period of time, I, I actually changed my approach from very top down and directive through struggling and learning from the struggling and then eventually to just sitting and, and listening to what's around me. And this is where the project starts with, with the motivation to start uh, and explore this relationship anew and to conduct a proper mutual reintroduction between us humans and, and more than humans that jointly navigate the space. And even if the motivation is very personal and, and is very specific to this particular site, I believe many aspects of the research can be later abstracted to other scenarios of human and nature interactions. And so it's June now, uh, so uh, most of the data collection part uh, is done. Um, it is not yet analyzed or examined, so I, I won't talk about the results, but I can uh, nevertheless share some observations I made along the way as I was guiding uh, the experts on the field. And these are mostly intuitive and emotional, uh, but for me, they, I, I found them equally important. And so what I feel is the most prominent and reoccurring feature that I sense across all the expert groups um, uh, actually resonates with what Astrid was saying as well before. And it's got less to do with exploration or explanation of the space, its actors and its dynamics. And it actually has got to do with reflection of our very human nature and our own habits, preconceptions, imperfections, and 
failures, of course. <laughs> so the threads that unites each input from the guess are, I would say, first and foremost, our human condition, the anthropocentrism, and then only second, the context of the forest where we've performed our activities. So we were constantly reminded that it's, it's us humans conducting the research and not the other way around, and that the motivations are ours, the egos are ours, and, and the failures are ours too as well. So this um, unintended quote unquote lesson I've, I've learned so far, uh, before even analyzing any data, uh, maybe actually banal, but uh, that's why it can be easily overlooked, but that makes it even more important to explicitly verbalize. So um, I hope I don't get too pedagogic, but uh, and these, I, these are my feelings so far. Um, and it's four of them, and one would be um, to to best relate to to our more than human surroundings. It's it's very important to be aware of who and how we are and why we act as we do. So that would start with reflecting on our actual human condition, and then of course extending that towards race, class, gender, and all the way to personal motivations. Then second straight after would be expecting our human nature, uh, accepting it, <laughs> as well as expecting it, and, and using it as a departure point for, for informed action. And then uh, being able to appreciate the lack of acting and lack of personhood of the modern human world, which by no means imply lack of agency or intelligence. And combining all of the above, uh, and maybe sounding a bit utopistic, but still, uh, learning from our natural surroundings that we too can sit still, listen, attend, and let grow. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, Mikael. It was just really delightful to take the walk through the garden with you there. And of course, what you've really done for us is to bring to the fore the experiential and the affective dimensions of being in a place and kind of tuning into more than human ecosystems. So thank you so very much for that. And um, we've got two more speakers. So I hope uh, in the Zoom room, you're not feeling too tired. Um, and then we'll, we'll um, turn to our discussion and get a bit more interactive. But before that, I'm just so delighted to welcome Klaas Kautenbrauer. He is a senior researcher at Het Neue Institute in Rotterdam, and he also teaches theory at the Garrick Rietveld and other academies. A consistent element in his work is the intersection of different knowledge practices, technological, artistic, legal, organizational, scientific, and more than human. And he's going to discuss one of my favorite projects um, today, and I think you'll all be quite blown away. So welcome class, the floor is yours. Thank you very much uh, for this lovely introduction and also for the uh, fantastic talks that I already heard. Um, and the project that I'm uh, about to present kind of ties in with many of the things that have been, not everything, but there's a lot of stuff that will come back uh, uh, now. So I'll, uh, try to briefly explain to you uh, the moving parts of the ZOAP project. ZOAP, for more life. So the why is clear. It's the pile of uh, issues that we're confronted with, climate crisis, ecological devastation, um, the awareness, the kind of the, the, the widely shared knowledge that uh, ecological re regeneration is essential, um, uh, but also the uh, lack of concrete, let's say, um, anchor points for action in here. So knowing all this and still being unable to actually move, to actually make uh, a difference. Um, so a uh, project tries to kind of offer an, um, yeah, a handle in this, in this situation, a handle for everybody who is concerned, wants to make moves and is also not, let's say, does not want to be crude about this, does not want to be violent about this, but wants to be careful and wants actually to... Uh, be the seed, provide the seeds of a world that uh, uh, that is different in its internal logic than the one that is actually coming to a collapse. Um, ZOOP is short for zooperation. 
uh, which itself is a combination of the words cooperation and zoe. So it's actually collaboration with life. Zoe meaning life in Greek. Uh, it's a, a governor, sorry, it's an organizational model for um, basically any organization that wants to, um, uh, that basically safeguards the interests of other than human life and makes them part, makes those interests, the, the voices and their interests, part of organizational decision making. It's, um, it combines a governance model with a learning process and ZOOPs together form a movement. And all three things I'll explain a little bit better. This is the governance model. Uh, it comes down to um, when an organization becomes a ZOOP, basically signs the ZOOP contract, they install a speaker for the living. This is a person, a human person, that acts on behalf of the zoonomic foundation. This is a little bit technical. Maybe I'll explain it later uh, um, in more detail, but uh, for now I only have seven minutes. So the zoonomic foundation has one task only, namely to represent the voices and interests of other than human life within zoops. They delegate, they give an assignment to the speaker for the living. The speaker for the living is assigned to an organization. This is all in, in collaboration. We decide who this is. The speaker has um, the task to translate these voices and interests into organizational decision making and basically act as a teacher, advisor uh, and board observer in the organization. Um, in practice, um, the speaker helps the ZOOP to follow the zoonomic annual cycle. Um, one more thing before I go to the next slide. Board observer is actually a model we derived from the shareholder logic. In this case, the shareholder is not some huge investor that is protecting its uh, financial interest. It's actually uh, all bodies in the world that uh, had together make up an ecosystem and that have like they freely contributed to the uh, to the existence of everything that lives, including us, and are kind of yeah are in need of an addressed balance in how to work together so this is the, the core of the zoop project so a board observer uh, gives binding advice uh, if you want to be a zoop sorry the this is the um uh, the speaker for the living that acts as board observer so this this model is derived from uh, one part you could say the way guardians operate in the sphere of um, the legal personhood of mount taranaki Wanganui River and Te Uruwira Forest. These three famous cases of legal personhood that was granted to, uh, and yeah, I also don't like the word natural, but uh, for sake of time, natural bodies or non-human natural persons, if you could call them. And the other bit is the, the governance model is actually a translation of the shareholder logic that I just described. Uh, so in practice, the speaker for the living with the ZOOP, um, uh, organizes a learning process for the ZOOP. Uh, and this is the zoonomic annual cycle. Uh, and it consists of reading your own operation, the, the own operational sphere of the ZOOP through three questions and then acting on them with the fourth, that's the interven intervening. The three questions come down to what bodies form the ZOOP. This is at, yeah, in terms of wording, an extremely simple question in terms of answerability, rather complex and hard. It's also not possible to answer this question in full. This is also the point. Uh, but you can make a beginning. That's also the point. So what bodies form the ZOOP? These are more than human bodies, natural uh, human bodies, but also buildings, cars, digital systems, and also the bodies that are touched upon those bodies, uh, but also uh, organizational bodies, legal bodies that act through regulation, maybe de democratic bodies from a bigger distance or corporates that yeah, uh, organize stuff and that become the reality of a ZOOP. They uh, have an ex actual active role in forming the ZOOP. So it's both formed from the inside and from the outside and by a lot of bodies that are existing on both, uh, uh, both inside and outside. The second question is, what are the life worlds of these bodies? And that comes down to basically trying to, um, um, how do you call it, crawl into the skin of all those bodies that form the soap. So both the, ecolog the ecological bodies, the, the modern human bodies, the, the ravens, the rooks, the mushrooms, what have you, but also the building, uh, the regulatory body, the car, and what is the world that they can perceive? So what is the, the ability you there is to um, communicate? And the, the second question that belongs to this one is then what are the meaningful signals what these, that these bodies respond to? Yeah, food and habitat and, 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 and security on, on behalf of non-human bodies, but maybe electricity and other stuff or uh, 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 human artifacts, 
democratic decision making or power play or financial gain for yet other bodies. This gives you a map um, um, that allows you to characterize, to diagnose your zoop. This allows you to give a first kind of crude overview of how those bodies are supporting or not supporting, obstructing each other, but also how they could support each other or how they could obstruct each other or in what ways they are currently completely ignoring each other. And this is this third question is a kind of diagnosis of the ecological integrity of your zoop. Ecological integrity is, a, I, I find it still a fascinating, a fantastic term because it talks both on the systemic level, the multi perspectives that come together in integrity in an integral perspective. At the same time, it talks of ethics. So it kind of yeah, it hits those two complex notions in one go. So I think it's fantastic. So this gives you a diagnosis for an ecological integrity. Uh, and the first time you answer this, I'm, is, I'm only one, I'm still, oh dear. Uh, okay, I'll be quick. The first time you answer this gives you a reference frame, a baseline assessment, and on these questions you act and you commit to uh, um, uh, to perform interventions that improve the ecological integrity of your operation. Uh, I'll skip the references. The last, oh no, I'm, I'm doing well. The last bit is that uh, because the SOAPs all work with these four questions, because they, although they're deeply situated, always these questions come down to particulars that are uh, of a certain place and time. Although they, but at the same time, they work with these two questions and this allows them to um, answer in ways that are also partly shareable. So um, uh, an important part of being a ZOOP is that you share your knowledge, not that you only work on your own increased ecological integ integrity, but that you share your findings so that the first hotel that is a ZOOP makes it easier for the next hotel to be a ZOOP. The first cultural institution makes it easier for the next. And that all these orbs can also build on each other's knowledge. Right? The deeply complex questions of reducing certain chemicals from your operational sphere, or how to relate to uh, how to make your building provide habitat to uh, rooks and, and, and ravens, or how to uh, develop relations that are not on the level of species, but that are on the level of bodies of actual individuals. Um, that's it, basically. Uh, so the long, one last uh, remark. So. Zoops on their own work on ecological integrity together, and this is quite an ambitious score, I'm fully aware of this, but we have no time, as you all know. Uh, together we work on uh, transforming the economy into a regenerative economy, which we think is equivalent to a human support, human inclusive ecosystem, to hark back to the presentation of Clive. Um, so our fundamental goal is to overcome the, the nature culture divide that got us in this, yeah, being recodified again and again, that got us into this mess and to start all over again, but within the logic of the organization that's well developed and using the logic of the law that's also at our uh, disposal. Thank you. Thank you so much, Klaas. Uh, I love the project because it kind of gives a new structure to govern environments that kind of draws from this natural personhood to really subvert the shareholder logic and put kind of more than humans onto the board. I find that really exciting. Um, so if I could get you to stop sharing your screen. Oh, uh, I, I, I can, yes, sorry. Fabulous. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, and last but definitely not least, we've got Phil Tovey from DEFRA, which is the UK's um, Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs. Uh, and Phil leads the DEFRA Futures team in providing strategic foresight in support of the UK's governmental food and rural systems through a combination of global catastrophic risk analysis some futures narrative assessment, mapping non-linear so social ecological system change, and also a range of other speculative futures approaches. So at the end of the set of talks, we're returning to the questions of futures that Astrid opened with. So Phil, the floor is yours. I'll pop up with one minute to go and let you know. Thanks, Laura. Yeah. Um, firstly, really wonderful to be here, and um, I'm really fortunate to go last because so much of what I'm going to talk about is has has already been covered. So it will really allow me to focus on um, some of my personal experiences 
of operating in some of these liminal soft spaces that Astrid talked about and trying to integrate some of these practices working directly with policymakers. Um, I really struggled for a title for this, um, but the notion of journeying um, seemed to be pretty apt at describing those experiences into more than human spaces. And so hopefully I'm going to try and um, present some personal reflections that don't necessarily rep represent the views of the department um, that are in that relational space of working directly with policymakers. Um, I'm going to start with this um, fictional quote. Um, I like to think of beaver, salmon, rain, oak and willow deciding with John, Aurora and the elders on how to improve the health of the River X, a council of all species. And we could ask the AI to help translate or partake even. So that, that quote is, is, is fictional because I didn't want to directly quote colleagues um, in our water policy uh, and evidence advisors that we're really conducting real life strategizing dur during some of the final stages of the foresight program that we've been leading to support some pioneering work that DEFRA has been involved with setting long range environmental targets under our new environment bill. And that quote really encapsulates um, a lot of what the other speakers have said, which is we have each element of that complex system um, that Astrid wonderfully just, uh, presented in the Venn diagram, where you have every single element coming together to form a coherent new concept. Um, and this is reminiscent of some of the work that the German based arts um, project um, Terra Zero um, presented where they're rethinking ecosystem regulation through technological innovation. And so it's multi-domain, um, it's multi-practice, um, and it's in inclusive of a number of different types of innovation that together present a transformational um, trajectory to help steer um, policy into that more than human space. And so I wanted to talk about some of the perceived barriers um, uh, to the more, more than human world actually materializing in, in policy. So some of the common things that come up is about language. And I would argue that it's not necessarily about language, but it's about poor quality conditions for deeper listening. Mm -hmm. um, and that inhibits uh, many alternative more than human concepts being taken seriously. So to talk about um, zoopics or to talk about even interspecies decision-making um, or um, more than human goals in AI ethics, um, those compound terms um, being put together are unfam unfamiliar. Um, but if you create the conditions of which people can, can literally have the time to read through and digest what is being said and contextualize it, then actually the, the language then starts to become um, an enabler. And so we personally, um, through my work, we've moved from um, a position that I'd never thought we'd be in to seriously considering interspecies um, decision making uh, in an um, eco democratic um, structure and trying to figure out how we, how we might um, transition to those. So, the very idea of talking to the animals, talking to the river, listening to the river um, mm -hmm. would be really alien, but it it is possible to do if you create the right conditions. And so it's not that the innovation of the idea is bad, but the lack of integrated systemic theory of change that leaves the more than human concepts invariably isolated and weak. So the other speakers have really covered this where it's about multi-vector points. So great that you can embody the beaver, um, really rubbish if you don't do something to address the fact that the farmer will want to shoot it if it damages his crops. Mm -hmm. So you have to address the governance issue. You also then have to address the complex um, relationships with the water companies and their relationship to the, the farmed um, embankments. Because if you don't do any, either one of them, you might have the best um, conceptualization and powerful evidence base even of, of more than human processes, um, the, uh, the other powerful parts of the system will bear down on that. Um, and so this is really about building up in a systemic way. And I, and I don't think it's largely down to a lack of imagination, although the, the asterisk on that is to say 
that always helps. Um, but it's about demonstrating feasibility. So taking it from something that is um, you know, a creative expression to saying, hang on a minute, we really could do this. And now let's focus our attention on solutionizing ways in which we could, we could move from that creative idea into making it real. Um, but that kind of challenge at the bottom there, there's a huge weight of historical framing that really underpins most of the design of, of okay. notions of Western society. So th the challenge um, we are up against is really significant. And that's why this is a transformational agenda and not a um, incremental improvement process, which is often the way policy really works. So the challenge is to support policymakers um, in making transformative policy. And so I just offer a few ways to do it. I've talked about a few of them, but through um, a futures approach that um, does good horizon scanning, uh, which can never be underappreciated, um, which is part of the reason why I'm here, is spotting for and looking for examples of where this is already happening in practice. And um, the Finsbury Park example was one here in, in the UK, which was um, really inspirational to that. And we were able to point to that and say, look, this is where people are actually partaking in an approach that is very different to the traditional way in which we are viewing it. That gives it some credence, but it's not enough. So you then have to demonstrate unified concepts. And so this is where you can draw into other domains and say, there's a huge momentum with artificial intelligence at the moment. Um, the UK government recently published its artificial intelligence strategy, strategy, which was highly ambitious. All of that energy is not being driven into more than human, um, around more than human concepts, but that doesn't mean that it can't. And so where we now have examples of Frinsby Park and, and Klaus talking about um, uh, observing and sensing what organisms are in your ecosystem, let's do that through a tech mediated way where we can use the benefits of artificial intelligence to help us um, visualize, track, monitor, and start to forge new tech mediated relationships with the species that as I look out of uh, my window into the full hedgerow and into the fields, I don't know are there because we've lost a lot of that, that form of knowledge. So building that coherent concept can then tie on other, other kind of powerful um, energies that are pushing into kind of different domains. Thanks, Lara. And lastly, I think for all of us here, um, and definitely one of my key reflections of, of working with policymakers to try and support them in this, is that you need to exercise leadership. So it's no good just disrupting their worldviews um, and leaving them with uh, that fragmentation and chaos. Um, if one, you're not willing to share the risk of going into these scary places as well. Um, and so that, um, within a de departmental sense, means taking professional uh, risk as well and not leaving it all to the policymakers um, to have to deal with their, their, um, the, the pressures that they are kind of rightly under through our democratic processes and, and functions of government to have to conform to. So go with them, hold their hand, but also kind of be, be the person that can speak for the future um, in the way kind of Klaus re represented that you can embody some of this um, transformational thinking. So thanks ever so much and I look forward to the discussion. Wow, well, um, I would like to give all of the speakers a virtual round of applause because I don't know about the audience, but those presentations really blew me away. And certainly um, I'm surprised at just how much crossover and mutual shared interest and um, how much closer we are than I think I could have ever expected. And how amazing to see something like Te Terra Zero pop up, which I know has been really kind of inspiring for all of us. So I think we've just kind of sat for an hour and we have, um, you know, really listened intently. So feel free if you want to kind of stretch and get a glass of water. And we're just gonna have a kind of informal start to the questions. Um, certainly I thought um, there were a few kind of areas that I thought would be really interesting to follow up in the discussion. Um, the first was kind of transformations, like what can we say about this transformative agenda? what kind of change is transformation? 
um, that we really need to make. Um, and it was wonderful, Phil, that you gave us such concrete kind of ways forward with that. Clive gave us such a good insight into worldviews, into kind of, um, as you also said, Phil, the kind of we of the historical frames that we're coming with. And, and even Mikael was encouraging us to be reflexive and to understand kind of how we're coming at, at these concepts. Um, I thought it was really interesting um, that actually some of the four ways that Marquetta put forward of kind of convening with um, natural environments are already kind of feeding into the policy. So we've got this huge affective and kind of experiential dimension. Um, and of course, if you work in sociology of science as I do, scientists really understand those dimensions of work when they go into the field. What's the saying, you, you know, you have to measure, you can't measure the same river twice, um, but that kind of tends to get excluded when it gets written up. So kind of how we write back in that kind of effective and experiential dimension. Um, and then kind of dealing with these divides, these splits that we have the kind of nature culture divide that class brought up. That's kind of how we're in this mess in the first place, I think you said class, but also healing these kind of splits between science and creative practice where kind of in, in previous eras, science was kind of a little bit purifying itself and creative practice was maybe taking on this value laden work. Um, and kind of coming together back again to recognize each other's positions in pursuit of this um, transformational agenda. So that's a little summing up, I thought, of some areas that we could cover with the discussion. Um, I'll let that percolate through all your brains and turn to the um, chat. I think we already had a question from Joseph Walton. Joseph, do you want to unmute and ask your question directly, or would you prefer that I asked it for you? Hello. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you, everybody. So fantastic. I guess this is perhaps a question um, for Phil, but anybody who wants to can pick up on it, maybe class as well, um, or anybody. When we think about integrating the more than human world into um, the kind of cognitive decision-making processes, whether they're technological, social, or you know, some some kind of combination. The the thing that it always gets me is is the existence of predator-prey relationships. When when the flourishing of one species um, perhaps depends on impairing the, the the flourishing of at least individual members of another species. Um, and I don't. I, I, yeah, I, I would just really love to to, to hear people's thoughts on that um, in, a, in a really open kind of way. Um, like I was, um, Joseph, I, I was loving that question in the chat and was hoping to get a chance to talk to it because I think it's, it speaks powerfully to what a lot of the creative practitioners, I think, explore in the research, which is no, notions of control um, and um, the felt experience of control as well. Um, so you see this manifest in policy terms really, really starkly. Um, so the trade-off between in, in the introductions of wolves, yes, fine, as long as they don't come anywhere near me, um, but what happens if they eat the children, et cetera? Um, they could eat some of mine, I've got four. Um, so I think we need to, again, look at really innovative ways to solve this. Um, and so, I, I don't have any solutions for this, but but one idea, kind of going back to um, some of some of the ideas of um, relinquishing some of our misconceptions that we have immaculate knowledge of of the more than human world, which we absolutely don't, and so revealing some of the ways in which um, and dispelling some of the ways that we currently frame the predator prey relationship as compromising another's flourishing, mm -hmm. I think there's a reframing job to do there. Um, um, I probably would feel fairly confident to say that, that you know, the, the wolf taking um, the, the deer does the opposite of compromising the, the deer's um, 
species flour flourishing and, and ecologists could, could that kind of help with that but but that's got to kind of close um point here i'm sure we'll come in around narrative about framing some of that so again maybe using some of those technological approaches to kind of um explore and visualize and demonstrate and bring into kind of people's worlds the the mysterious unknowns um that really shatter some of these preconceptions um of that kind of darwinian framing that would be one offering but yeah i'm sure clive have some views fabulous i can see you've got your hand up clive so feel free to go ahead thanks yeah no it's a, it's a great question um and, and of course i don't have an answer to it um but but a couple of thoughts one is um well i think there are sort of two acts aspects there's a of course, there are predator and prey relationships that, that abound in nature. Um, that's the way it works. Um, so I guess it's a question of, you know, how concerned we should be by that. Um, um, and, and sometimes that has to do with the boundaries that we've, we've put around those issues, um, how we measure and count things. So sometimes we get very concerned about um, numbers of species dropping in particular areas. Um, but surprisingly to me at any rate, often those taking those figures in isolation uh, can miss, you know, important wider perspectives. So, you know, I don't know, there may be declines of, you know, certain birds in Scotland, um, but they're increasing elsewhere in Western Europe. Um, overall, their numbers might be the, the same or, or, or increasing. So should we be concerned about those declines in Scotland? Species come and go, that's what they do. Um, so, so we need to, to we need to look at those trends in a, in a much in a broader context to have a better understanding about you know whether those changes are significant and meaningful and whether we should be doing something about them. Um, and then the other thing I think is a, is a more kind of um, uh, I suppose ethical question about um, you know how we frame predator prey relations. I think most of for most people um, our experience of um, nature. Um, is, is often um, mainly in terms of farms and safari parks and zoos and so on, and, and very much controlled in that sense. Um, our experience of nature, as it were, raw in tooth and claw um, uh, on the Serengeti and, and, and other places um, is massively limited. Um, so why use largely cultural anthropogenic framings of nature to determine our understanding of predator and prey relations. So I, yeah, I just throw that into the mix. Fabulous, class, go ahead. Yeah, I, I totally see where this question comes from. And in the ZOOP discussions, we always call, call this the bodies versus species issue. So it's the personal empathy for the prey, maybe, that comes into the play of, of this question. There's an ethics that derives from a human individual that is now ex that we, in one level, want to expand over all species and all bodies, and then it meets limits. Um, and uh, it also don't know how to solve it. And it's, it's really about, so in a way, it's about, let's say, the pragmatic solving is always within a zoop is like, okay, uh, all bodies are welcome, but never too many of anyone. So it's always like, so it, the whole idea of invasive species is also a bit of, yeah, all bodies are welcome, but like if one really kind of uh, rules out all the others, then yeah, then we have an issue. Then it diminishes the quality of life for too many other bodies. So it's a, but of course, this is an, an, a human in a way, it's a pragmatic, but it's a human translation of an, of an, of, of an, of, a, of an observed reality into a policy, into something that you, let's say, used to justify actions. Um, so I don't have a solution and it's, it's um, I can only observe it. It's a kind of, it, yeah, it's this, once you step over the boundary of looking at species versus looking at bodies, becoming, uh, forming personal relations, then this becomes a really painful issue. And the other one, but that's, I think, mentioned several times, it's it, it, this, yes, there are predator-prey relations, there are like endless amounts of, of, of um, ecological relations, mutualistic uh, uh, relations of ignoring, complete embodiment, inhabitation, and predator-prey relations are one, and there's enormous amount of versions of dependency and articulating each other's boundaries that, that you need to also, you, you cannot look at predator prey in isolation uh, the, indeed the the health of a herd depends on predation also as a, and uh, so but that's not uh, it, it is sad for the sick animal that is being eaten that you can't ignore that either that's um, yeah 
Uh, I think those answers give an insight into the knowledges that humans need to learn as we invite more than humans into our politics. Chris, you had a comment about Donella Meadows. Do you feel like revealing yourself and giving that? It's an interesting one. Hey, um, thanks. For, so, well, it's interesting. So, um, Anne Douglas and I have been writing about the work of Helena Newton Harrison, the, the sort of pioneering um, ecological artists. And, and we've been focusing on something they, the, so they say that in about 1969 or 1970, they decide they made a decision to do no work that did not attend to the well-being of the ecosystem mm -hmm. of ecosystems mm -hmm. so in effect they reordered their values so that actually success in the art world was and and it was sub subsidiary to paying attention to the to ecosystemic well-being um which is really interesting and actually, it's it's really difficult to even understand what that means. Um, but actually, they they also then kind of. But it, it's interesting because actually, in Donella Meadows' terms, it's a it's a shift of a paradigm. So it's the mo it, in her terms, it's the most powerful way to change a system is to change the paradigm. Um, and I just want, but but interestingly, because in a way. The, the, uh, the, your, your example of, I mean, it's been fast, can I say, this has been just absolutely fascinating. Um, and, I, and, I, and, the, and, and in a way that, because the, but I suppose my, my question is, doesn't all of this actually require us to understand some things about how ecosystems work, like, the impact of entropic, you know, the, what happens, what we're doing is, is creating massive simplification. So, you know, it's, it actually requires us to have a level of understanding of, of ecosystems, systems and dynamics, as well as empathy with, empathy with other living things. That the, that the empathy with other living things on its own is, is insufficient if it isn't ma married with what you were just talking about in terms of that, that complex set of relationships, which is more than just predator, prey, and so on. And I, I just, yeah, it's, it's, I, I suppose what I want to get at is what's what, what needs to be behind, you know, if, if Terra Zero was genuinely going to produce an AI, what would that AI, what would the really fundamental things that AI would have to understand in order for it to genuinely act for the well as, as a pro, as a mechanism for well-being for a whole forest system? I'll shut up at that point. I'm not sure what the question is, but you, you get the gist of it. Would anyone like to come back on that or shall we take Vitalia's? Okay, let's take an input from Clive and then we'll move on to Vitalia next. So I just, well, it's really just to check my understanding of that with Chris. So I might say, for example, that a new paradigm, a new way of looking at nature might be to say, or to bound it in terms of um, its contribution to net zero and being nature positive, more diverse, more resilient to, to future climate and so on. And, and I would argue that, you know, we have to do that because um, stopping emitting fossil fuels gets us two thirds of the way, roughly speaking, to, to net zero. But the other third is all about land use, land use change right across the piece. So you can do anything you like, provided um, it contributes to net zero and it's got to be diverse so that it's resilient to future change, to future climate change. And that's, you know, I would, that, you know, my kind of initial bounding, my, my paradigm, if you like, would, would that be the sort of way that you're thinking? Can I, yeah, can I come back? So actually nature works on exchange. So how are we putting more back than we're taking out? I think it's a high, it's even a higher level than anything to do with any, po any policy that, that's fundamentally human oriented. So net zero is fundamentally human oriented. There are some aspects of ecosystems that will benefit from the increased carbon, you know, in a way, so the, the question to me is, is in a sense, we, we've, 
we we have the whole ecosystems services mechanism assumes that it's about services to humans but actually nature is fundamentally an exchange so what are we doing until we move from an assumption that that nature ecosystems provide services to us and that's the main thing until we understand it as an exchange we're we're we've got a very very fundamental problem so i think for me um i find an event like this is maybe a signal of a new paradigm emerging um, I want to hand over to Vitalia and take another question from the audience, if that's okay. Go ahead, Vitalia. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. I think my question is very yeah, similar to what Chris asked already. Maybe it's, um, yeah, to, to look a little bit deeper if we are, with all this research that we do, which is really very highly about addressing nature, not as a machine, but as a sentient being who has also feelings and own dynamics and speed and intelligence. But we still feel in very mastery position, no? that we are there humans to fix climate change and to fix biodiversity loss and to fix all other things that we are losing. I'm wondering if there are some projects that really step away out of this mastery position of this colonial you know, thinking and uh, comes with completely a new approach, which is not letting to collapse, but letting to emerge new thought that doesn't replicate this extractivist patterns that we know, because we change vocabulary in the way, and then we think that we, we are a new paradigm, paradigm but, but we are just repeating what we know, even with imagination. So would be curious to see if something experimental is coming on this direction. Thank you. Brilliant. Does anyone from the panel want to come back on that? Class and maybe Marquette, do you want to say something to that or Mikael? I'll, I'll hand over to class and let you have a, have a think about it. Um, in a way, it relate, your question relates to the previous one. It's like, what is the, let's, what's the angle to find, to find an alternative that actually is an alternative, that is not repeating the, uh, the system as, as they are? So the, uh, through a lot of iterations, the questions that we, that the, the simplest way to ask the question of a zoop is to how to become a symbiotic body. So a body that supports all the, that uh, uh, basically enhances the life carrying capacity of, of its surrounding, um, uh, of itself and of its surrounding. Um, and um, uh, the issue, sorry, that, so that's the question, how to do this is uh, practiced by several uh, protozoops at the moment. And um, one uh, fa fantastic example I find is a small farm south of the city of, uh, north of the city of, nee, south of the city of Nijmegen in Amsterdam, Bodemzicht, who uh, are a fully regenerative farm. So their work is like they, uh, one of their uh, basic mottos is also mycelia are better farmers than humans. They're basically, and so they, they their effort is to increase the life carrying capacity of their farm. And they are essential for this because they can operate in this small scale. If you allow the non-humans to do it on their own, this will also happen, but it will take 300 years and they can really speed up this process by uh, performing very careful interventions. But their job is to perform to increase the life carrying capacity of this farm and on the side make food for humans. And uh, so not only for humans, but make food for all beings that live there. And this, yeah, I find this very hard to understand this in a colonial frame. I think this is really deeply other. And it's, uh, but also extremely pragmatic and practical and real and, and generous and beautiful. Yeah. And it's also really sustains a lot of people. So it's at all the best restaurants from Nijmegen get their food from this farm because it stays amazing. So it really, I mean, it's able to function within the world uh, as it is also to some extent, which is also quite uh, remarkable. Yeah. Great, let's hear from Phil. Thanks, Laura. Um, Vitaly, I think it's a, it's a wonderful question and it's one that plays me, I think, we need to talk about strategy here. Um, 
which is is realist in the sense that I think we can build compelling arguments um, that are well supported by evidence and well articulated by some of the inspirational kind of creative approach approaches that I think have been demonstrated here but they're not necessarily going to be um, adopted um, without any solid theory of change which recognizes the the incumbent system and the power of which that has and the system's interest which is Im embedded within it um so i'm speaking quite abstract but i hope you can all imagine um what i'm really talking about here which is actually that there, there are actors which quite naturally have embedded um sunken um and stubborn interests in maintaining the status quo um so actually we have to address them. And in lots of environmental strategy, you can look at the reformist agenda, you, you can look at the pre-configuration agenda, which I think is uh, strategies, which I think are really interesting. There's some good examples in the UK on transition towns with Rob Hopkins stuff um, that's trying to um, create the system in waiting. Um, I think there's, there's some pros and cons to that. Um, or, or you can kind of go to the, you know, the, the Jenkins stuff and go on the more extremist end and, and look at mom stuff about how to blow up pipelines. But whatever it is, there needs to be a, a strategy for how we bring um, some of this about, because we, we, we know the, uh, the Earth system's kind of trajectories on this. They're, they're adaptive cycles. We've got a collapse and transformation. And those are the two things we could, should be concerned about. Um, Interestingly, they both have the kind of um, similar um, kind of end characteristics that the incumbent system uh, is, is destroyed or kind of moved away. It's just whether or not we do it in a planned way or whether or not we do it uh, in an unplanned way. And I think this, uh, you know, which, which one is more harmful for, for most, most people if we kind of take a suffering ethics on that, I think is, is really important. So yeah, big questions of strategy with all of this, I think. Yeah, thanks a lot. Maybe if I can add on this, uh, yeah, how we can also depathologize suffering and grief, because I think that's also part of what we have to embrace. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Yeah, Astrid, over to you. Yeah, just to really briefly follow up on that. Um, I was just thinking about this from a policy perspective as well. And Maybe I'm simplifying it a lot, but I think it's already pretty revolutionary to acknowledge like the natural system, um, trying to make it more horizontal and less with humans at the top. And I was really um, inspired by what Klaas just said, that it's always a human translation, um, whichever way we bend it, just so to say. It's okay, which is inevitable, so better live with it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and I think, uh, Joseph, you also mentioned that in the chat, that. Um, perhaps it's better to recognize anthrop anthropocentrism, which could be another way to, to frame this discussion. But it's interesting that, because I was um, thinking about Meadows uh, leverage points when I was preparing my presentation. And I think, I mean, I would like to challenge the idea that the paradigm is like the big goal, um, the big leverage point to aim for, because I think um, going for multi-species perspectives or feral perspectives, for example, in the goals of a system or the material flows or the information flows, just the other leverage points um, that Matt Meadows mentioned is very interesting um, and, and I think useful as well. Um, yeah. Wonderful. Um, I want to abuse chair's privilege and ask a question myself, um, especially to Marquette and to Michal. Um, particularly about the kind of affective and experiential dimensions that creative practice is so fluent in and, and gives so much attention to. How do you kind of feel that those knowledges could potentially flow into kind of, um, yeah, this kind of framing that you have given so well, Phil, that kind of, you know, creating the system in the waiting strategy for how we kind of bring some of this about and it strikes me that there's a fundamental question about kind of experiential and effective knowledge is not kind of being as valuable in the 
in, in other settings. So Marquette, maybe I could ask you to say something about that. Yeah, for sure. And I think it kind of develops also on Vitalia's question, you know, is it the question of scale actually? That are we looking for some, we are having these grant requirements on creative practice. We are asking grant questions. So do we want to see some kind of huge and spectacular experimental production that is going to, you know, fulfill, tick all the boxes? These productions already exist, but they're often not seen, which is what Phil was also mentioning. Sometimes these things are just very humble. They happen on the ground. It can be a beekeeper, small scale beekeeper having a small bee farm somewhere, but it doesn't really get into the public eye or it doesn't really get into the public space and it doesn't get all the awards at Transmediales and, you know, Ars Electronicas. And then they are kind of often not seen. So I would say there is also that element that uh, this deep listening and uh, the ability to really like be patient and observe and search patiently for things is something that we are missing in the area these days. And I also know, Vitalia, I think you are also co-running some kind of a community garden space, which I would say almost like I wanted to say, maybe, you know, you are actually doing it yourself. The, uh, what you ask about. Oh, that's beautiful. Um, and I really love that emphasis on deep listening. Mika, would you like to come in? Uh, yeah, um, I just wanted to, uh, I like the idea of, uh, or I like your question on experientiality. So I, I did previously study sociology and psychology and it's been hugely helpful for, for my thinking and imagination. Uh, but I just find that, um, and, I, and I don't mean to offend anyone, but um, um, writing and reading uh, is not, uh, has its power, but uh, I think experience it's just much more. <laughs> Having a personal bodily experience can really transform people in 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 that point, in that moment. Um, if it's if it's insanely huge, if it's not, it can you know spread a seed of transformation. And this is where I started to shift towards uh, visual arts because I, I mean, visual arts is in, it's it's just as marginal as uh, academic writing, let's say, or maybe it's slightly less marginal. Uh, I think it's slightly less marginal, but the, and this is what, what Marketa was mentioning that these works already out there, but it's not part of the curriculum to to go to a gallery or or it is, but um, it is and it is. <laughs> it's probably you'd go to museum, but you probably wouldn't go to a contemporary art gallery where this is becoming a big topic. And I think uh, creating uh, exper experiential environments can really be transformative, but. The fact is it doesn't have a huge audience and it probably doesn't have the audience uh, at the level where the change is made or at the policy makers. Uh, but if, if it did have, I, I yeah, I, I would love that. <laughs> and and um, yeah, I'm interested in how to actually s spread this uh, to, or, or, or bring this to the attention of policy makers or, or not just have it as a hot couture, something of a status that you come and cheer with the champagne, but actually, because um, I, I appreciate, I approach art making as like a storytelling in a way. And I think uh, that story expressed with various senses and comprehended in, in, with your own body and senses can, can really leave, leave an effect, even if it's maybe subconscious or, you know, it doesn't translate into certain actions straight away, but yeah, I th that's what I believe in. That's fantastic. I'm going to bring in Phil, but I see you, Gaurav. I'm going to come to you next. Thanks for showing yourself. I realized I missed you in the chat. So Phil to respond and then I'll go to you next to ask the next question. Oh, thanks. I'll just be super, super quick. Um, I think the that there's a bit about if it if it looks too much like art, then there is something that instantly makes it a little bit too easy to keep it in the art um, bucket and it and it not be taken seriously by by policymakers. But I think the 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 way to get over that, I mean, we we try and you know my team tries to be an intermediate uh, intermediary for some of that stuff. 
um, and force policymakers just to say, no, no, hold with that thought. What if? And where could it go? Um, but also, I think um, for, for the um, arts uh, research practitioners here, kind of um, being a, a bit more brazen with how this could address um, current policy questions, um, if, if you want it to. And so just, um, you know, uh, I think kind of reaching out and not being too scared and use like intermediate intermediaries like like we are um, and they exist and just reach out because you do such wonderful stuff and uh, there's absolutely no reason why um, and there's lots of reason why it should kind of be taken seriously in policy making um, uh, and so yeah um, make, making that uh, in, inviting policy makers into it I think um, is, is, is one proactive step but thanks. Brilliant. And just to plug our uh, September event at the Ouroboros Festival, we're going to host a knowledge exchange event for creative practitioners experienced in working with policymakers to share their experiences with others. So keep a lookout for that. Um, and now, Gaurav, over to you. Hi, thank you. Uh... It was a lovely panel and uh, the discussions are really uh, thought provoking. And I'm just going to build up on uh, what uh, uh, Mikhail and Phil just said. Like, if like the work that is going on in this field right now, it does feel a bit too arty. Uh, I'm sorry if I'm offending someone, but and it does need to reach uh, a bigger mass because this is something that affects the. I feel that it affects the whole of humanity and it's responsibility of each and every person. And we probably as design practitioners, we being at a privileged positions, it is still reaching a very privileged section of the society. And how do we, and this is a question I ask, I'm, a, I'm, I'm studying design. So I, this is a question that I ask my professors as well. How do we reach that that bigger section of the society or bigger mass and get their uh, opinion as well instead of just creating another framework or uh, uh, an art gallery uh, or exhibition. Marquette, over to you on that one. Yes, thanks. Yeah, I think it's a really good question. I was thinking about it recently where I spent the whole day with the bees and it was this like hard work when you are sweating, you know, when you are just like the honeys everywhere and you can't, you can't move because you are stuck and glued to everything. And then I went to the Treaty of Finsbury Park LARP and suddenly I was supposed to pretend that I'm a grass and, you know, think that I'm a grass. And there was such a huge like difference between that. It was completely different, qualitatively different experience. And both were valuable. But I was thinking that there is something about stories. Now, I really wanted to share in the LARP the story of the physical experiential experience and how it feels really weird to be pretending that I'm a grass right now. So what I'm trying maybe clumsily uh, to say is that there is something about stories. It would be really great if art can help us to tell these stories to broader public, as you mentioned, about all these experiences in some non-intimidating way. Maybe it doesn't really need to be huge, flashy, spectacular, you know, installation or something like that. It can be a humble story that comes really from the ground and that is accessible, that people can somehow relate to, that doesn't overkill you with all the buzzwords from all the STS jargon. And you know, maybe there is something to say also about that. Quality and class, you can go ahead there. Yeah, two, two, two answers. One is, uh, or two responses, like one thing we realized is that everybody who feels attracted to soap is somehow bilingual. So it's, uh, I, I, and, and so it's a bit of, it's all, or literally or kind of metaphorically, I kind of versed in different knowledge practices, like able to understand what it is to uh, respond like an artist and able to understand what it is to respond like a, a maybe a scientist or maybe even a politician that, that so and in a way this became the heart also of this second question this what are the live worlds of and this is a continuous exercise in trying to see the world from a slightly different perspective so uh, and that's always the case so but then the hard bit is not just to accept all let's say positions as equal but to to still like keep on track and want to move the ball somewhere 
and 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 yeah on that front i'm uh, i'm not trying to brag but it's extremely interesting to notice that uh, really big parties in the netherlands are attracted to the zoa project and i think that's because i also uh, sorry this is not me i said i this sorry there i go sorry uh, it's not me it's like hundreds of people but we decided to like not compromise on our philosophical and artistic starting points, but to go as far as we could to make this as pragmatic as we could, but without sacrificing. So uh, this forced us to be bilingual or, and, and somehow for now this seems to work, but it's, well, yeah. So there's like re a really big agriculture fund, like a significant portion of the Netherlands is interested to become a zoop which yeah which okay this doesn't mean this is fully let's say have becomes a, like a hallelujah multi-species society one have one moment to the next but they're committed to developing a regenerative practice for dutch agriculture is fantastic so yeah i also don't want them to become an artist maybe that's maybe that's the short answer uh, but they but they need to be yeah they need to be able to work with the concepts that we developed in such a way that it fits their needs but still maintains the, the focus. Yeah. Fabulous. I want to take Astrid's response and Phil's. And then for the last 15 minutes, I want to open it up to the panelists to see if you might like to respond to each other's talk. So maybe you can think about that as you're hearing um, Astrid and Phil, and then we could do that for a little while. Okay, over to you, Astrid. Um, yeah, so Garo when uh, you asked your question, I was sort of reminded of something that class, I think, with the Zoho uh, example already illustrated, but this session is part of the new European Bauhaus uh, festival. And I think the Bauhaus is an example of a way that design sort of completely reconceptualizes ways of living, values, um, aesthetic uh, parameters of life as well. So I would argue that even if a design intervention starts small, it can definitely just influence every aspect of life. Um, but also more specifically, another way to make, uh, have art or design have a lot of impact are these soft spaces um, that I mentioned briefly, because that's just a way of uh, gathering very key people um, in a setting together, um, exposing them to new ideas and uh, new interactions, and then setting that free into the world. But I also have to make a side note with that because of course there are some uh, ethical concerns perhaps to that as well, because then there is a risk of um, setting up this sort of elite black box uh, governance space outside of the regular democratic governance um, context that we already have. So soft spaces was actually quite a negative term when it first appears in the literature. Um, so yeah, I would say that we have, have embraced it kind of as a way to um, change ideas with, with creative practice, but it's really important to keep um, that ethical um, risk in mind, I would say. Thanks, Astrid. That's a really interesting comment about the soft space political dimension which is really important phil over to you thanks like yeah um reflecting on the kind of the the, the artsy feel about this i think you know it, it it does something wonderful um and so it's got a lot of kind of qualities i think where where we've pushed it is to say okay we've had a really kind of interesting and creative kind of discussion about these, these types of things. And we're starting to think about how they could work and people naturally go to the places where they think it might be um, feasible and, and more likely to be adopted where there's less conflict um, or it's less of a contentious issue. So what we did is say, no, we're not going to do that. What's the most contentious issue in policy terms that we're currently working on and let's, let's make it work in those issues. So e even if it was just a thought experiment, say how could more than human approaches, if we were staying true to these principles, work to counteract horrendous storm sewage overflows in, in our rivers? Um, and I wouldn't say we were 100% successful at that, but we didn't want to create this separation between like, oh yeah, we can do some wonderful stuff over here but it's never really going to get into the crunchy zone where it's kind of high kind of conflict and um, high profile stuff. And I think we we need to kind of find where these the hard points are and really start kind of working with them. Because so, if we can do it 
in those areas, then actually we, we will have one learned a lot and to maybe given ourselves a big success. So an interesting area that I'm working with is, is in defense and saying, you know, if we can do some of this, you know, with, with defense, then actually um, where, where it is genuinely life or death decisions, uh, saying that as an ex uh, commando, um, we hopefully stand a good chance. It goes back to Joseph, your, your point about, um, you know, predator prey, you know, how do these things kind of manifest and how can they work and provide good outcomes where where the stakes are that high where where this is kind of addressing you know issues of food genuine food poverty you know what what is the more than human um, approach to this what solutions does it offer someone um in those real tricky situations and i think that would be a good um approach to take as well Uh, again, Phil, those are some amazing insights. I think we're learning so much, opening up each other's black box and learning a bit more about the context and process and the craft of policy making and creative practice. I wanted to ask if any of the presenters wanted to comment on or to reflect on each other's presentations. Now we've taken a little bit of uh, a few questions from the floor. Maybe I'm just looking in the chat and there is this question from Gora that wasn't really discussed. Do you think uh, we as practitioners should avoid getting into creating new frameworks and focus more on immediate action? And I would be like curious what you think actually. I would maybe say that creative thinking and creative practice is necessarily part of any immediate action that would be on the point. But uh, also with all these issues around, well, if it is too artsy, then it can be seen as exaggeration or overblown or not too serious. So how to navigate in that whole in that whole space? And our projects relate to it in very different ways, you know, like through different standpoints. So I would be curious from anyone, I don't have a specific person to pick. What do you think about the immediate action and the role of creative practice in it? And these imaginative approaches. Yeah. I think the uh, the risk of immediate action is that you uh, there's a lot of immediate action everywhere and like it's a lot of it is misguided so it won't help so unless you know what you do and then for that this yeah that's why these frameworks are developed so I don't I don't think how you can separate them really but I, I don't stop at the framework clearly uh, but uh, maybe hesitate with the immediate action if you're not sure yet which immediate action then I would start with the framework Maybe I could um, invite Clive to come back into the discussion because I feel like you gave us such an incredible kind of mapping um, from kind of um, scientific ways of knowing, counting the species, um, all through the kind of worldview dimensions and then the politics, who gets a say and a seat at the table. And it's, uh, I really just thought that overview just showed us um, a lot about how thoughtful nature Scott has been about kind of understanding the need to kind of um, balance some of these kind of um, social dimen dimensions that we would usually call social like worldviews um, and, and then the kind of pragmatics of kind of tracking the species numbers and making sure the kind of um, more than human communities are, are also being kind of taken care of. So if I could ask you to kind of respond to that in any way, that would be great. Uh, thanks, gosh, um, well, that's a big question. Um, I, I mean, I think a lot of the other speakers also, you know, touched on a lot of what I was talking about there. I, I suppose, um, particularly Klaus in the, in the Zoo Up project, and, you know, that, that seems to me to be creating a space in which you can consider the biotic and abiotic components of an ecosystem and start bringing people and views together to, 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 to inform decisions on that. Um, at, the, at the sharp end, you know, we've, we've used a lot of those techniques working with social scientists um, on particular conflicts in, in nature, numbers of deer, grazing and um, woodland quality, peatland restoration, um, dolphin watching in the Maori Firth and so on. And in all of those cases, there is a kind of common denominator where where particular uh, groups of people tend to get um, 
stereotyped as you know a wide range of people all having the same identical view <laughs> which obviously never happens um and uh and and the exercises we've done have helped to try and kind of break down some of those barriers and you know find ways to kind of move forward on issues that you know we would there's still a long way to go on all of that but um but i think that kind of participative deliberative um uh, those kind of approaches uh, are essential to you know to move forward um uh, on a lot of the work we need to do particularly around net, net zero and um and enhancing the state of nature Yeah, I think something that's particularly struck me is that it's not when we're kind of bridging knowledge production practices or becoming bilingual, as you've put it, class. It's also about the structures. So I think, for example, um, working with domains like water versus agriculture versus land use and kind of also um, maybe some distance between creative practitioners that maybe don't tend to fall into those domain shapes, but to speak to these kind of um, more kind of expansive sets of relations and kind of how to reconcile those. Yeah, so I think um, obviously I'll let class and Phil come in in a sec, but uh, I mean, I, I put a comment in the chat partly in um, response to Gurath's um, observation, but, but I think design is kind of, universally present in everything that we do uh, whether we like it or not <laughs> because we either design it in or we just don't think about it and then things fall down because we haven't thought about it so so i think um, being conscious about you know how we're designing um policy practice um you know all the way from towns and cities it's you know in in the uk certainly it, it's pretty hard to live active lifestyles because we spent the last 70 years designing places around the basis that people are going to move around in private cars um so of course it's hard to walk and cycle and wheel and do all those other things that we should um so so i think you know the, the consequences of not thinking about design um, within some of those paradigms and so on that we've been talking about, um, you know, really need to be thought through very, very carefully. And yeah, bringing people together to do that. I mean, I think another area where policy often fails is um, in the sort of co-production, co-design aspects of work. There's a tendency to think, to think, well, you need to talk to everybody about everything. And I don't think you necessarily do that. I think the kind of um, the mapping exercises that class was talking about, um, if you do those well and recognize the number of viewpoints that you need to bring into a conversation, uh, then you can be much more selective. But having done that on a basis of a kind of um, a rational step rather than just selecting people who think like me to have a conversation that I know is <laughs> where that's going, um, you know, I think we need to employ some of those mapping exercises that help us to realize the, the different viewpoints and perspectives that are at stake. Thanks for that, Clive. And oh my goodness, we could have another whole session about participation. We almost didn't mention the P word. And um, Phil, I could invite you to come in. Um, thank you. So, um, class, I don't know if you're following on because I was going to ask uh, Marquetta a, a question. Um, we, were you going to follow on from that, Fred? Or? I had one uh, point to add to the uh, the points of Clive, uh, actually to the also the framing of design work in the context of uh, real world uh, changes. Um, so it's, it's something I learned in a project a while ago where so in the context of uh, commissions where uh, the key element is not so much the quality, the key element seems to be where the budget is coming that pays for the commission. So if this is the culture budget, then what's expected of the work is that it performs as culture, which is not addressing the core issues of the problem, no matter how hard you try to address the core issues of the uh, organization. But when the uh, budget comes from the R&D department or the innovation department or uh, something uh, like a department of an organization, whether it's policymaking or a company or any other that is uh, actually has access to the, let's say, core formulation of policies, then the expectation of the, co of the commissioned work is also very different. Uh, so it's so that's way prior to the creative work itself that's who like does this trajectory this technical trajectory that i'm in, um, uh, engaging with does it enter the organization at the right point 
So that's yeah, but that's within a very specific context. But it does tell you a bit about yeah how change can be made. Yeah. Oh, that's a crucial point, class. Bill, handing over to you to ask your question. Thank you, um, Marketa. Um, I I couldn't remember the name of your research partner. Your um, slightly fluffier one. Um, it's Chewy. Chewy. Um, I, so um, I often wonder about um, participation of, um, of of other species um, in things like this today, right? So we haven't um, really tried. So we haven't tried to take a perspective, or we haven't invited that perspective in. So Chewy doesn't have a webcam or, or or a means to to address us in our language. And I just wondered if if you had any thoughts on. Uh, on on that you know how she would like to speak for for themselves um or not um because is that just a complete um you know anthropomorphic framing of of how she thinks um and if if it's the latter is, is that what do we do with that because actually so much of kind of the 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 eco democratic structures that we kind of maybe are looking to um at least in part, I think assume that there needs to be some contribution of of kind of insight and perspective, um, as as we do with other kind of representative kind of models, it, in to help the others kind of form consensus and decisions. And I, yeah, sorry. So, what's what's Dewey's kind of view on all of this? And, and yeah, I think it's important for us to accept the fact that Dewey would probably really don't care for this discussion like at all. He just doesn't care, you know. But what yep. he cares for is walking through the forest. And so what the thinking behind this whole project was is that what if we care for walking in the forest the same way as the other creature wants to do that so we can learn something from it. Because of course, like I think class said it before, we can't speak from non-human perspectives or for non-humans. I actually really don't know what, you know, yeah, he really doesn't think, I think anything about uh, the role of uh, creative practice in social transformation, but there is something that that these creatures can point us towards, and it can be reciprocal. So just the act of following the dog actually gives something back to him because what he cares for is the walk in the forest. So if you enable him to walk through the forest for, for instance, super extended amount of time, because we are trying to experiment with the idea of okay, the dog decides. Uh, which is, also, of course, also a very privileged position because when it starts raining, for instance, I can let that happen because I know that there is a cottage and there is a fire in the cottage so I can get dry again. But what if I don't have a cottage and I don't have a fire? So, you know, there, is a lot of, there are many things in, in, uh, in place. But uh, I think that there is something about the reciprocity of the exchange between humans and non-humans in this creative process but there is no way, or at least I don't know how to give a voice uh, to the non-human creature to speak to other humans, like here in this panel. Yeah. Uh, you know, only in the sort of like cute, comical, very like human-centered way. <laughs> Thank you. Wonderful. Oh, do you want to share that book class? Oh, you're on mute. Uh, I um, I didn't read this one, but this is yet. Uh, but I was it was recommended to me. But it follows up on a discussion that uh, the basic question of um, uh, Eva Meyer, who's a political philosopher for animals, uh, asked in her research in 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 Amsterdam. It's like so she basically observed that this question of human of non-human speak is framed always: can they speak as in the way that humans speak? Of course, they can't. But the question is, what are they saying? Can be answered in many, like uh, very, like uh, um, precise ways, and that doesn't. That's not the same as they will speak to us in this comical voice. But they are, of course, all bodies express themselves, eh? like treat their, uh, make choices, articulate, can even pretend things. And I mean, it depends on little bit kinds of animals. But so it's it's not so much as waiting for the speech, but it's learning to listen and to observe. And but this again goes on to the bodies of uh, of, of and uh, versus species thing, because here the individual really comes in also. Then knowing 
that dog is not the same as knowing all dogs because they really like i mean of course it's overlapping but and this is really way beyond the field of ecology this is really so that's the so that's why i showed the book the book starts with but to actually do this it requires the full tool set of science that treats uh, non-humans in in quantified ways and the full tool set of the humanities that can treat bodies in qualified ways and and the, and so so again but this is a, a version of bilinguality yeah. Well, for me, that's the perfect place to end the session because the takeaway message is this deep listening, setting the conditions for deep listening to each other's bodies and to Chewy's bodies and motivations as much as our, our colleagues and friends. And I want to extend my deep thanks to the panelists who have just brought the most exciting ideas and taking time to really share their work and perspectives. Um, I'm going to put into the chat um, the Creatures newsletter. Um, we haven't yet decided whether we're going to publish uh, this recording um, publicly, but um, you can check the Creatures website or sign up for the newsletter um, to get notified about that. And I just want to take one final moment to share my screen because the Creatures Festival is coming up um, in Seville in Spain um, at the very end of this month. In case you're in Seville or in Spain or um, we also have we're going to have a hybrid online version for at least some of the sessions um, you would be most welcome to join the Creatures Festival um, that will have, you can see here, an outline program. So some online sessions, an in-person exhibition. Um, feel really welcome to join us in whatever way you can. So thanks again to everyone and have a lovely evening. Thanks, Lara, for all the